Initially, it started off with vivid dreaming, in which I, I literally had, you could call them visions, I suppose, uh, which were quite otherworldly. They did not belong in the ordinary framework of reality that we normally live in. And they were saturated with the sense of space and scale and how man how man generally relates to these things it was very very difficult for me to begin with to know what to do with those feelings and i did all sorts of little sketches uh, which were sort of minute um, and rather timid gr grasping of the feelings that these ideas generated. But every now and again an image would crystallise very clearly, which may have come from dreaming or it may have been simply just welled up in me generally. And one such an image, of course, was the breaking moon, which I call Quiet Night, the big painting of Quiet Night. That was actually a lived experience within the dream state. I actually had a lucid dream in which I saw the moon falling on the earth. It was literally like that. And it didn't take a lot on my part to transfer it to a canvas because it was already there. When it came down to sustaining the creation of images on canvas and all that sort of thing, then I got down to looking at my world around me and just seeing it in the filter, through the filter of this perspective of space and so on. And I would see things in every day that I could use towards that. For instance, men at work on tarmac, you know, with steam coming up all around them, their bodies half hidden in steam. And there's a, there's a lot of drama in that sort of uh, setup where you've got man and machine working closely and it's very easy to just tip it into something science fiction, just the scale would be enough to change it completely. But always the motivating force for the imagery has been this flavor that I've always had about space and man's relationship with it, the planet and space together. You know, it, it's a very complex structure of imagery and feelings that I draw from they almost always come from something I actually have experienced. That's the initial starting point.
Picasso said uh, uh, about sketching, it doesn't matter how much, how hard he would work on developing or improving an image, the initial image that he made always had more magic than anything else that followed it. And it is, it's a magical affair, you know, it's a, it's a little rite of magic that one performs. The, the mark that is the very first movement towards the expression. It's crucial to me. Uh, so when I'm first confronted with an image, the, there is a, a little play that comes into being where I have to be very, very careful about the kind of marks that I make first. And I've learned from experience that when I get the idea of an image arising in me, I need to make a gesture on a blank piece of paper. It could own, doesn't only has to be just a, two or three lines maybe, or a smudge with a finger of charcoal. But whatever marks I make, I have to hold in my mind the essence of the feeling that arises with the image that's being called upon to be created. At that immediate juncture, when I make the very first mark, it has to be saturated with the feeling. After that, it almost doesn't matter. I can do almost anything as long as I can remember the action and look at the mark that came from that action inspired by the feeling that was first generated. I'm doing a second rough which will be a different variation of colour to um, I have to find the right theme of what I would call a colour chord for the image and it, it's about shifting the hues you know you can do this actually very easily on Photoshop much more <laughs> easily in a way <laughs> but it doesn't have quite the same end result fantasizing about another reality as such. I'm fantasizing about this reality. <laughs> and um, th there's a point here actually, which has been very, very fruitful for me, which is the, the thing about what lies off the frame when you look at an image. And what I've always tried to do with my pictures is to give the feeling that you are looking at a snapshot of a much bigger reality that is off canvas. So that you get the feeling that 
there was a shipyard somewhere in the location uh, which built this rather tatty looking structure and that, it, and that actually it might need going in for servicing fairly soon you know a few, few rivets need to be re, you know, redone it tying it back to the very ordinary is crucial I think in maintaining a sense of wonder about the stuff that's not ordinary it's very much a part of the spectrum I think that you have to, that a successful visualizer of science fiction has to do I think they have to tie it down to something that we are all familiar with even if it's an uncomfortable seat or <laughs> you know it, it, it's important I think for the for the viewer to be persuaded that it's a whole world that you're seeing a snippet of it's very crucial that I think This point about where the scale of things comes from and the sense of mass and so on, it's the inevitable consequence um, of looking at the minutiae of life, whether it be people digging the roads up or whatever. In my mind, I always find myself seeing the groups of figures or whatever in relation to a much larger reality so that these people are on a planet you know that idea you know that simple idea when you have crowds of people on a plane all I can think of is they're on the surface of a planet you know that's the immediate uh, connection that I make so there's a sense of the sense of massiveness that inhabits everything that I kind of look at. Mass in terms of masses of people, mass in terms of scale. It's always that relationship between the, the sort of the little individual bit of human beings and them playing out their lives on this vast theatre whose reality is even vaster than you can possibly show. So again, we come back to that thing about stuff that's off the canvas. You know, that feeling that there is a vast universe off the canvas. It's quite crucial that actually, becoming more so as, as I continue to work actually.
even though we are tiny, we actually are capable of containing within the skull the perception of vastness. You know, that's a real mystery to me, you know, this idea that we are actually just these sort of flesh and blood things and that our reality seems to be contained in just the framework of our skulls and yet our experience of reality is vast. You know, we have this enormous sense of space and time contained within the physical structure of our skull. So there's, a, there's that constant, that relationship between the tiny, insignificant human being and the vastness of the universe. So the fact is actually, there's no difference. It, it, it's almost as if, you know, we ourselves are vast cosmoses. <laughs> of a human life um, is such that obviously we will never get to see the full scope of our imaginings. I mean, there's no way that that can happen. And yet, I have this feeling that even though we personally, as individuals whom you can name, will not see those things, it's as if the human race itself will see those things and therefore that's okay. It's almost like, um, in fact, I do quite believe this, that each one of us in our DNA contains the total memory of all that has been experienced in our race, by our race. So that in some encoded form or another, we know what it is like to be uh, Neanderthal. <laughs> we know what it is like to be um, going through the ages of man and so on that we have, that, that locked away in our DNA, I'm, I've got this suspicion, <laughs> that's the only thing I can say, I've got this suspicion that locked away in our DNA is the total experience of all human beings that have lived. And so although we may not have access to it, on some indiscernible level, we know it, we know about it. And the same goes for our descendants. And it, I don't know how it will work or how it will play out, but I can't help the feeling that even though I know this physical form will never ever see some of the uh, worlds that I have imagined or, or believe may be out there and that may eventually be experienced by human beings, that the total spirit of man <laughs> will have that inheritance, will be able to, to experience all of that and it doesn't matter that this particular one experiences it for first hand, doesn't matter.
Right from the beginning of creating images that have, can be described as science fiction, I've been motivated by the atmosphere of things. I've been motivated by the feeling that is generated. And the more specific that it gets, the less I get fulfilled by it. It, it has been a constant attempt on my part to, to become more and more general as I go along and less and less specific. And in a way, it's reflected by the, the whole nature of contemporary art and how it has sprung out of traditional art. The fact that the abstract has become um, a big issue in the production of imagery in a contemporary idiom. For me, there is a parallel within science fiction and where it may have sprung, the genre may have sprung out of storytelling, um, for me it has been constantly an attempt to get into the essence of the feeling that is generated by the whole idea of the future of man and space and all of this sort of thing. And actually what my ideal is to bring the genre of science fiction right into the realm of abstraction almost, so that what one's really trying to do is communicate a flavor of vastness, of light, of ascendancy, of uh, an expression of a magical being incarnate on a planet <laughs> That's what we are, you know, and, and, and that wonderful, maybe it's very corny, but that wonderful expression that came out of Crosby, Stills, Nash and Young, I can't remember exactly how it goes, but the, the phrase, we are stardust. I mean, to me, that is a reality. That is what we are. That is where, we, where we're going. And I want to create an art that describes that sense of we are stardust. And it at the moment, you know, for me, in my limited way, I, I've only uh, tried to approach it by creating a sense of scale and space. It may be that there are other ways of doing it, but that's the only way that I know personally. And for me, what I see as the future of my career as a science fiction artist is to somehow or other bring out the essence of that feeling without being at all specific so that it's not culturally identified, it's racially identified. <laughs>